Well, good morning, everyone. We want to continue talking about marriage. Uh, if you weren't here last week, that's okay. Just a quick recap from the lesson last week. Marriage is a beautiful model of the love union between Christ and His church. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5. Now, last week we uh, appealed to Genesis chapter 2 in verse 24. If you want to open your Bibles to Genesis 2, 24, we'll look again at that today. But last week we, we used that text to show that God's design for marriage was first of all rooted in creation. And it was epitomized in a binding covenant contract, contract and it's expressed through the same selfless love which Jesus showed us when he died on the cross. Today what I'd like to focus on is what I think the central aspect of marriage is, and that's the idea of oneness or unity. When Eve was formed and she was brought to Adam, the author breaks into the story with his own commentary, and he says in verse 24, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh. So becoming one flesh is not just about the sexual union. It's about an all-encompassing oneness, a complex unity where the independent I gives way to the interdependent we. And if you see, in, this, is, this is seen in, in Adam's poem, his, his first words uh, at his response of seeing his wife for the first time in verse 23, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, woman, because she was taken out of Ish, out of man. That's covenant language. That's togetherness language. And if you look at how Eve was created when Macy read, you saw that Eve was created as a result of God's cleaving Adam's flesh in two. And therefore, marriage is, the, is, is restoring that one flesh of humanity. When they come together, they become one. So with this in mind, I want to look at four principles which help us practically work out what this oneness means. This is uh, just what I could think of this week, okay? So it's not, <laughs> not comprehensive, but these are four things that I think the Bible teaches us about the oneness of marriage. And the first is oneness in companionship. And the exhortation here, brothers and sisters, is be friends. Be friends with your spouse. The, great, the, the bride says to her groom in Song of Solomon, verses, uh, chapter 5, verse 16, This is my beloved, and this is my friend. Now, if you think about it, most marriages, at least in our culture, we can say this is how it all begins. You're friends first, before anything. You share common interests. You, have, you spent time together. You really liked each other. You talked on the phone for a long time. Back in the days when phone lines could be tied up. Do you remember that? And your mom was saying, get off the phone. I have to use the phone. But you were in love. And you were friends. You just loved talking and being with one another. You know, the, the romantic aspect is important. We'll talk about that later. But that's not as lasting as this one. The companionship thing lasts the entire marriage straight from the beginning all the way to the end, that bond. And friendship is a unique blessing from God. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It, it, that, that friendship relationship gives us what other relationships can't give us. And so your spouse ought to be your very best friend. Look at a couple of verses from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 18, 24, and then 17, 17. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. 
So can you see here that wisdom is teaching us a friend can actually be even better than family in some cases. Now there's loyalty in your blood relationships. Those of you who have siblings, you know that you can count on them, hopefully, in times of adversity, right? But they might not particularly like you. They might not want to always spend time with you and have a cup of coffee with you, but a friend you see, he loves at all times, thick and thin, right? Even through adversity, but even during the good times. And just as a side note, in verse uh, 24 there at the top, the word sticks, do you know what word that is? It's the same word as hold fast in Genesis 2.24, or cleave in Genesis 2.24. So once you get married, you've got a choice. Either you can cultivate and deepen that friendship, or you can take it for granted and you can watch it die a slow and painful death. There are three things I think that can help us keep our, our marital friendship alive, maintain it, and possibly, brother or sister, I don't know your situation, possibly rekindle that friendship that you started with. Remember this verse when Jesus is speaking to the seven churches in Asia? He tells the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, 4, and 5 that they need to remember, therefore, where they have fallen from. They need to rekindle that love that they had at first. How do they do that? They need to repent and do the works that you did at first. Can you see, can you apply this to marriage? What did we do at first, married people? Well, we did stuff together. You remember those days we did stuff together with your spouse? When you're dating, that's what you do. You spend time with one another. Sometimes it's very planned. It's very meticulous. We're going to go to this place at this time, and these are the things we're going to do. Other times it was completely spontaneous. I get off work at 5. Let's meet here and have dinner. Let's go see a movie. Back when Rachel and I were growing up, that meant going to Blockbuster and spending 45 minutes looking at the tapes. Young people, you don't even know what a VHS is. Don't worry about it. You'll never see one again. But you're, it's, you just enjoy spending time together. It doesn't really matter even what you're doing because you're doing stuff together. But when you get married, you move in together. You do life together. You have a full schedule. Then you throw kids into the mix. And you think you're getting all this really together time because you are technically together, but... When you really think about it, how much of it is really together time? When you're really looking in, in each other's eyes and you're really talking with one another. There's a real exchange there of friendship going on. If you want to maintain or, or rekindle your friendship, you got to be intentional and give special priority to doing stuff together. I realize in, in, in there are, there's a season of our lives, especially if we have kids, it gets crazy for a while, and you got to get creative. It's before the kids get up or it's after the kids go to bed, but you got to do stuff together, whatever that is. It doesn't have to be traditional date night stuff, but do it together. Don't go off and, 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 and enjoy life on your own and have my little alone time. I understand that, you know, sometimes you may need to have some alone time, but, but don't forget to have the together time too. The second thing is show gratitude to one another. You know, when, when you're dating, you go out of your way to show your appreciation for your significant other, your, 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 your gratitude. But over time in marriage, we can tend to take our spouse for granted and we can tend to fail to show our respect for all that they do and all that they are. I remember, this is a just shameful thing. I remember something that happened not too long ago. Rachel, I must have had a bad day, but Rachel, she brought, she had made dinner and she put it before me. And I think, I didn't even look at her. I think I just said kind of, a, just said a thanks, you know. But in my heart, I wasn't, really thinking about all that she put into it. And I thought in that moment, I had this moment of clarity. I thought, you know, when we were dating, I would have never done that if she made that meal for me. I would have looked her in the face. I would have showed my gratitude. I would have given her a kiss. I would have said how tasty this was. Thank you. Thank you for showing me this, this, this love. You see, this is what we do when we're dating, but you see how it can easily slip away. Familiarity 
can sometimes breed, if not contempt, but just neglect. So we need to repent and show the gratitude that we did at first. How do you show gratitude? You guys know how to show gratitude. Through acts of kindness, expressions of affection. Hug your wife, hug your husband, kiss them, tell them you love them. Words of praise. Tell them when they're doing a good job. These are the kind of things we show, how we show gratitude to one another. And then another thing here is to think the best of each other. Before marriage, we were so busy loving one another, admiring one another, we had a tendency to overlook some of those foibles, right? Some of those flaws, and we just naturally thought the best of each other. Before marriage, oh, he was carefree, spontaneous, but give it a few years and he may become careless and irresponsible. Before marriage, oh, she was a very goal, uh, goal-centered and driven kind of woman, but afterwards, she's just controlling and she's manipulative. Before he was laid back, afterwards, he's lazy. Before, oh, she's a very sensitive soul. Afterwards, oh, she takes everything the wrong way. She's too touchy. These are the signs of a loss of friendship. We all have our flaws and our weaknesses. We talked about that last week. But friends tend to give each other the benefit of the doubt and see the good in one another. So an important part of being one is enjoying and cultivating our companionship. Be friends. The second thing here is we also need to be one in purpose. And the admonition here is to be partners. Be partners. Genesis 2, 18, the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Eve being a helper to Adam demonstrates partnership in marriage. In other words, God didn't just create Eve because Adam was emotionally lonely and he needed a friend. Oh, Adam had a job to do which he couldn't do alone. He was to to work and tend, keep the garden. In, In verse 15, he needed a corresponding partner, someone fit to him with unique and complementary strengths to help him accomplish that work. That's partnership. That's oneness. Husbands and wives, you are to plan things together. You are to make decisions together. You are to work together in small things and big big things, big decisions, material things and spiritual things. You're to do them together to achieve those goals. Now, the, 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 the writing in the New Testament speaks of husbands and fathers as those in a, in a role of, of headship, in a position of authority. But some men over the years have mistaken headship and authority in marriage as dictatorship. But if you look in Ephesians 5, if you look in Colossians 3.19, a parallel verse that speaks to husbands and how they're to treat their wives, Husbands who are in the position of authority are never told to exercise authority. That's never the command. Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, 1 Peter 3, they're not told exercise authority over your wife. No, that's implied that they are in that position. But you know what they are told to do? Is they're warned against improper use of authority. Colossians 3.18 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. In the same way, fathers are told to bring their kids up in the right way. They're nurturing the admonition of the Lord. But don't provoke them to wrath, fathers, you see. So husbands are commanded to love their wives, care for them. How? As Christ does the church. Therefore, the way that headship expresses itself is through care, not micromanaging control. It's through responsibility, not authoritarian, dictatorial rule. So for a husband and a wife to be one, they've got to be partners, each making distinctive contributions toward achieving the same goals. And I think there are two keys here. The first one in partnership is proper communication. Proper communication. 
Everything the Bible, this is just such a broad topic, right? Everything the Bible teaches us about communication, that especially applies in the most important human relationship that we have, in the marriage relationship. Honesty. Never lie to your spouse. Ever. It is never okay to lie to your spouse. Clarity. You speak the truth in love. Clarity. Learn to express your thoughts clearly. Your spouse is not a mind reader. They need to know how you feel. They need to know what's on your mind. Don't expect them to read your mind. You have to tell them. Openness and transparency. If something is on your mind and it is important to you, we need to learn to, to share that. And we need to cultivate a safe environment of communication where we feel comfortable sharing that. So we want to speak graciously, kindly, wisely, constructively, all that the Bible tells us to do. But you know what? It's perhaps even more important than speech is how we listen to our spouse, right? Because communication is a two-way street. It won't work when both people are talking at the same time. We need to become good listeners. James tells us to let every person, could we say, let the husband and the wife, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Proverbs tells us a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only expressing his opinion. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 7, that husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding way. Understanding way. Listening is how we understand one another. Uh, observation, watching. And that's difficult. That's an act of submission to listen to someone, to give them the floor. Believe me, your job in some ways right now is a lot harder than mine. Because it takes a great deal of humility on your part to take in the words I'm saying. And that's how it is in a marriage relationship too. Our ears always have to be open and attentive to our spouse. So how do you speak to your spouse? How would you say you speak to your spouse? Are you harsh with them? Are you dismissive with them? Are you controlling? Are you angry with your words? How do you talk to, about your spouse to other people? That might be a good indication, too. And how do you listen to your spouse? Do you feign interest? Do you roll your eyes? Do you interrupt them constantly? Are you checking your phone when they're telling you something? Partnership requires healthy communication. And the second part here is the idea of having a consensus in partnership. As we communicate, we need to shoot for consensus. Now, that's, that doesn't mean, you know, one partner having the control and calling all the shots, but neither does that mean a compromise where both people give up what they want and neither one is satisfied. A consensus is coming to a joint agreement, and this is the heart of behaving as a unit. When you say, we're going to move forward and achieve this goal together, this is, this is what we both want. This is what we both think is important. So this is what I call being on the same page with your spouse. That's presenting a united front. And the reason why this is so important is, well, first of all, it's an expression of oneness, but people will try to drive a wedge between you and your spouse. They will do that. Your coworkers will do that. Your children will do that. Oh, they can smell division in mom and dad's relationship. Well, mommy said, I can do this. Well, daddy said, I can do this. Well, we need to teach our kids that mom and dad are one flesh. What mom says, dad says. What dad says, mom says. Because we're one. You can't play one off of the other. So that can't happen if, uh, unless two become one. And two people can't act as one when neither one of them is enthusiastic or convicted about the goals that they're setting and how they're going to achieve them. So three steps to building a consensus. First of all, again, communicate to be understood. When there's a decision to be made, each one should give their viewpoint, communicate clearly what is on your mind until the other person understands. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Do you, do you know how I feel about this? Let both people talk. Let both people listen. And then prayerfully appeal to God. Any time a decision has to be made, we should always be looking to God for answers and for direction. 
So the goal, of course, in our marriage, we talked about last week, is to glorify God in every decision. And so we go to the Word for instruction, and then we appeal in prayer for wisdom to help uh, us guide through that position. But possibly, you know, one of the, one of the other important things here, and uh, the, the third point is to put each other first. Put each other first. Most marital dysfunction would completely disappear if we would simply put each other first. Most marital problems can be traced back to the sin of selfishness. This is what I want. Okay, what about what he wants? What about what she wants? No, I'm going to do this because this is what I want to do, and I'm unwilling to change. But all of these problems would go away if we simply did what Paul tells us to do. What he's telling the, the whole church to do it certainly would apply to the marriage. In Philippians 2, 3, and 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let each of you look not just to your own interests, but the interests of your spouse, right? What is important to her? And when we show this kind of humility in love, the decisions are not going to be a compromise. They're going to be a consensus because, hey, what is important to her is important to me because it's important to her. And we're one flesh. And so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice or give, give this up for her because that's important to her. So it's never a compromise. It's always a consensus. So be one in purpose. Be partners. And also, be one in romance. You need to be lovers as well. Now, while becoming one flesh shouldn't be reduced to just mean physical intimacy, it is a part of becoming one flesh. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, Paul connects the concept of becoming one flesh with the act of intimacy. He quotes Genesis 2, 24 in that verse. Now, sadly, sex has been so cheapened and twisted and abused by the world that we rarely hear the positive biblical side of it because we're so busy trying to warn against immorality and the abuses here. But what that can result in is an unbalanced view where some of us then just have basically this, this kind of negative uh, underlying view, which is not healthy when you go into a marriage relationship. You've got this whole book in your Bible called the Song of Solomon. We quoted from it earlier. And it is presenting sexuality as a good thing, protected by marriage, not an evil thing that's just made permissible by marriage. It's not just a concession that God makes. It's, it's a blessing that goes all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2. Song of Solomon is a series of love poems between a bride and a groom, and they're expressing their desires and their excitement of being one with one another. Now, I don't want to be ex explicit, but I want to be as explicit as what God's Word is. And God's Word is holy, and it's there. It's there for us to read. And it's there to teach us that this is a gift that God has given us for us to delight in and take pleasure in, and we shouldn't feel guilty engaging in it and delighting in it. They were both naked and not ashamed. But we do need to be super careful about it. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. Those who practice immorality, they're going to be judged, the verse goes on to say. So, we can delight in it, we can enjoy it as God intended, when we engage in it within the safety and the, the, the sanctity of marriage. So, we need to treat it carefully. We need to treat it uh, in, a, in a sacred way. The Song of Solomon says, Set me as a seal upon your heart. I am yours. You are, you, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you are mine. A seal upon your arm. Why? For love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. It, its flashes are flashes of fire 
the very flame of the Lord. Is fire good or bad? That depends, doesn't it? That depends. Like fire, if love is not kept within very specific boundaries, it can be utterly destructive. But also like fire, if it is kept within safe boundaries, say like a fireplace or a fire pit, it can be a great blessing, can it? Bring warmth and comfort. It can be productive. So this act, the act of intimacy, is really a reaffirmation of your wedding vows. It's a symbol, a physical symbol of the covenant commitment that we made with our vows. When we cleave to our spouse in love, we're saying, I cling to you. I put you before all other earthly relationships. You are mine. I am yours. You are bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. I nourish, I cherish you. However, if we are reaffirming what we have confessed and vowed to do, well, then we're confronted with this question. Is what I am doing with my body consistent with my attitude and my behavior towards my spouse? In other words, is this act true or is it a lie? And in this way, the act of intimacy can strengthen your marriage expressed in the right way. Intimacy can actually lead one to repentance. Now, I'm not saying we need a a sober moment of spiritual reflection every time. That would kill the moment. But properly understood, what happens in the bedroom should motivate us to be more giving to our spouse, more thoughtful, more considerate, more holy, committed, loyal, tender-hearted, more one with our spouse outside the bedroom. So be one in romance. Be lovers. And then the last thing we want to say here is one in Christ. One in Christ. Now, I understand there are some people here, obviously, who aren't married, right? And there are principles, hopefully, you can take away from this lesson. And I also understand that there are some people who are married to people who aren't Christians. Now, this lies outside of the scope of what we're talking about today, but there are verses that talk specially to you in the Bible. But ideally... When both partners are Christians, they're one in Christ. Therefore, we need to be peacemakers. Because no matter how hard we work at being friends, being partners, being lovers, sin sometimes finds its way into our marriage. So we need to be experts in grace, making peace with one another. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And of course, there are two keys to being peacemakers, and the first is to apologize. Apologize. Jesus tells a story about the man who's about to offer his gift on the altar, and he realizes his brother has something against him. He doesn't go and worship God. No, he leaves the gift there, and he goes and he's reconciled to his brother. We've got to be honest when we've done wrong. We need to admit it, confess it, apologize for it, and seek forgiveness from our spouse. So admit the wrong. Here's some practical tips for apologizing. Avoid ifs, buts, and maybes. That is, don't say, if I upset you, I'm sorry. Or, I know I did X, Y, and Z, but, or maybe I could have acted differently. Perhaps you have a point about that. Well, these are ways of apologizing without really apologizing at all. Be specific. Admit the wrong being done and acknowledge that you've hurt your loved one. And then accept the consequences. There are consequences to our actions. And when the apologizer acts like the apology just completely wipes out the infraction and then complains about the consequences, well, then it nullifies the the, the force of the apology. Sin has consequences. And if our spouse forgives us, we can't demand that he or she erase the consequences completely. And then we also need to ask for forgiveness. And this is an important part. So often we think saying, I'm sorry, just kind of covers it. But we need to ask for our spouse's forgiveness. Forgiveness is an act of mercy, not justice. So we're asking for something that we do not deserve when we're asking for forgiveness. Now, our spouse has an obligation to God. But that doesn't mean that we can demand it from them. 
because we're asking for mercy. And then, of course, we need to be forgiving, right? Be kind to one another, Ephesians 4.32. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, how? As God in Christ forgave you. So forgiving your spouse means absorbing the cost of the wrong that they did instead of, of, of waiting for them to pay for it or demanding that they pay for it. And because we sin, there can be no oneness in marriage if we don't learn to forgive. And it's the same thing within the church, right? For this family at Dulles to function at all as a family, we've got to learn to say, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. If we can't forgive one another, we can't be a family. It's not going to work. We came into this family on grace, didn't we? And it's sustained by grace and mercy. And that's the same thing with your marriage. So when you promise to forgive your spouse as God forgives you, you're making five promises as seen in Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with our, us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far, east, uh, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So when we forgive as God forgives us, we're making five promises. I will not dwell on this. Number two, I will not bring this up again or use it against you. Number three, I will not talk to other people about this. Number four, I'm not going to punish you over this. And number five, I will not let this stand between us. So being one in Christ means being peacemakers. We need to learn to say I'm sorry, and we need to learn to say I forgive you and really mean it from our hearts. So why should we pursue these things in marriage? Because they, they make us happy? They will. Because they bring us peace? They will. Because they provide fulfillment and meaning in marriage? Yes, they will. But these are just the wonderful byproducts of becoming one flesh in marriage. The reason we should pursue oneness in marriage is because that's how our marriages will truly, truly represent the Christ church relationship to the world. That's how we preach the gospel with our marriage. Is your marriage preaching the gospel of unity? Let me tell you, your children will know if you're one or not, depending on how you respond to them. They need to know who God is through your marriage. Your coworkers, your, neighbor, your neighbors will know if you're one or not, depending on how you talk about your spouse to them. So be one. Be friends. Be one by being partners. Be lovers and be peacemakers. Now that last point, being in Christ, that's where all of this takes place. That's the spiritual sphere in which we can glorify God. And there might be someone here who's not in Christ. What does that mean? Well, you're either in Christ or you're in the world. The world is, is departing, right? It's fading away. It's going to be judged. But you can be in Christ and have all of your sins washed away. You can be made a new person. So if you need to respond to the gospel, if you need the prayers of this church, then come forward as we stand and sing.